Hey, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a lead technical advocate with Cisco Learning and Certifications. And Snackers, I'm Hank Preston, Principal Engineer with Learning and Certifications here at Cisco. And welcome to Episode 131 of Snack Minute. Here in 2024, January, we brought in one of my best friends here at Cisco, Brian Byrne, to talk to us about one of his favorite topics. My name is Brian Byrne, and I'm what Cisco calls a technical solutions architect. Uh, I'm a pre-sales resource helping customers build large-scale network designs to kind of meet their business needs. Uh, been with Cisco for about 12 years, but prior to that, uh, I spent a good half of my career in an operations role with a global service provider building large-scale MPLS networks. So routing is kind of fundamentally who I am. It's been a part of what I've done over the past you know, 15 or 20 years of, of my career. That's awesome. So I know when you're here, you're going to talk to us about BGP and, and how much you love it. And so could you tell us a little bit about what it is and and just let's uh, let's you know just let's just talk about it. Great. So as we you know, BGP is it's this this topic that it's it's kind of been fundamental to what I've done over my career, and it's it's uh, it's a scary protocol. I think especially as most people kind of start first digging into to how uh, they interact with routing protocols. You know, back when when I started, back when Hank started. RIP was kind of the entry point, you know, not that anyone really ran RIP, but it was something that we could wrap our heads around. And BGP was kind of the end state of where we got to. But, um, you know, historically, how customers have looked at that is BGP is the, is the protocol for the internet. I think we all kind of understand that's how we get data back and forth across the two. But really, as we've looked at over the last 10 years, BGP has become this foundational element of how we build large scale networks whether it's for things like fabrics in the data center that are built around VXLAN that uses BGP for exchanging route information from that side, but also being able to use some really cool, interesting features that are in BGP to simplify how we deploy networks, how we design networks and get out of simple things like maybe how we can pull redistribution or some of the, the challenges around redistribution out of the network. It's really kind of been the, the key to what, what a lot of enterprises are doing to build up a network these days. So let's before we dive into some of the newer use cases for BGP for for those snackers that are watching that are maybe earlier in their career they haven't had to bite into the BGP apple just yet why is BGP the routing protocol of the internet right what what role does it fit that some of the other protocols do and and why is it why does it have that spot right that part of prominence of being what it takes to make the internet work Right. So if you think back again, 25 years ago, when this internet thing was first starting to become interesting or, or in these places, we had routing protocols. We had things like OSPF, we had RIP, we had EIGRP, but they typically kind of operated under a single domain of control. As an organization, I ran my routing protocol and they were designed to quickly reconverge the network. So when I saw an issue, I wanted everything to kind of self-heal itself so that we could still get connectivity back to the other side. And how it, those were really built was around concepts of flooding, whether it was RIP that I broadcast to everyone, my route updates every 90 seconds or every kind of certain period of time, or with OSPF, when I saw a change in the network, I was going to flood across to everyone, uh, you know, everything that was happening in the network. Now, picture a scenario where maybe uh, I'm based out of Columbus, Ohio, and I'm peering off to the internet and I'm advertising a couple of routes and I have a bad day in my network and I'm flapping around and putting it in the route table and I'm withdrawing it, I'm putting it in and withdrawing it. Well, if I flooded that across the internet, think about the 8 million routes that are going to be impacted from that standpoint. You know, the idea that how do I actually get these, these updates across a large period or a large, uh, a large geography? What BGP was really designed to do was break the internet up into a number of administrative domains. I'm going to own a portion of the, of the network. Hank's going to own a portion of the network. Kareem's going to open a portion of the network. I'm going to be responsible for how, how I get traffic in and out of kind of my area. We call that an autonomous system. Hank and, and Kareem, you guys are going to manage that side. And then we're just going to tell each other, hey, to get to this set of sites, just send it to me. I'll take care of getting it to the right location. So we're really kind of building these boundaries into the network so that we don't have these massive challenges around kind of flooding traffic from everywhere across the across the globe. Yeah, I think it's that that piece of administrative ownership, right? Responsibility at the doorways is important. Um, I, I like everything you said, except the part about Kareem owning a part of the internet. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, you're not you're not helping me with my confidence, Hank. <laughs> That's all right. All right. So, so that's where BGP comes from. Why, why is BGP making its way into the inter, into an enterprise, right? Enterprises have their protocols. So why are we now having to see BGP inside now, Brian? One of the big reasons that we're seeing BGP work its way in is one, 
BGP is designed to work at a scale that maybe a lot of our routing protocols don't. If we look at just the context of the internet, how many routes that I have to manage across it? I think the last time I looked, I think we're north of, of 8 million routes on the network. I may have just made that number up, so please no one kind of <laughs> validate that number and then put a, put a comment in from that standpoint. But there's millions and millions of routes that are in the table these days. And as we kind of go through, uh, as, as we kind of go through building out the network from that side, OSPF, while it can handle a large database, you drop 8 million routes into it, kind of melts down on top of it. So one of the big things that we're, that we're seeing around BGP, so if I look at something like a VXLAN fabric where I now have to track individual host entries, well, BGP is a database that's capable of kind of handling where all of those individual entities sit from that side. There's also, and this is my favorite thing about BGP, and this is in particular about eBGP, is there's a built-in loop control mechanism built into it. So if I redistribute a routing protocol into BGP and I send it to Hank and Hank's not configured correctly and he sends me that route back the other way, that's a loop. The way we have to manage that from a configuration standpoint is I have to put all of these rules in place and deny entries and I have to use distribution lists and those pieces. Well, BGP just says, hey, if I see a route coming from someone that I sent to them, just drop it on the floor. It simplifies how we build the network. We don't have to worry about all of these extra controls. More importantly, it protects us against someone making a misconfiguration and kind of advertising that route back the other direction. So I have I have a, a bit of a newbie question for you here. What happens if what happens if Kareem's segment does not support VGP? What happens then? It's just not it's not connected. It's 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 not talked to, or is it just ignored? Yeah, so so Kareem, that's actually a really interesting question because we do have to have some considerations of, of how we address that. And if I think back to my global service provider days, we did have some routers that just didn't support BGP in that environment. And typically where we fall back to is we have to fall back to the lowest common denominator routing protocol that we know that we can support. Interestingly enough, back then we were using RIP. So as I would have this really advanced protocol of BGP or rip kind of this very low level piece. And then all that I would do in that case is I would just have to put some rules in place or some routing constructs in place to get those routes from the provider. And then I'm gonna peer BGP downstream into the rest of my environment. So I handle kind of the BGP advertisement piece of it. I, I was gonna say, it, it comes down to Kareem. If you're part of the, if, if you wanna be on the internet, somebody has to put your stuff into BGP. Okay. So if someone does it on your behalf, if you can't do it yourself. And that's what okay. most, most, a lot of enterprise customers do it that way, right? And that's the partnership with the service provider is they, they peer with OSPF or EIG or P to a large service provider and the service provider handles the rest of it. And, and what I was gonna add to that though is, is most platforms that have been built by any manufacturer, especially Cisco over the past 10 years, are gonna have support for BGP where, where that's there today. So it's, it's almost becoming ubiquitous across the entire portfolio. All that said, I actually did recently see a Reddit message in the Cisco Reddit forum where someone was trying to peer with a, with a cloud service provider and said, I need redundancy and don't tell me to do it with BGP because I don't want to run it. And the entire thread was people saying, no, 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 just do BGP. So again, even in these cases where maybe we don't want to, that really becomes the default answer in a lot of these cases. Mm -hmm. There's always that one guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just because you can awesome. doesn't mean you should. <laughs> So this, it's been really good. And I, I love this idea of getting back and kind of talking a bit about the fundamentals of, of what makes the networking work, because with all of the enhancements that we have, a lot of these principles are still out there. So let's say you're, you you talk with global customers, Brian, you said you, you build these large, wide networks for the largest customers. Where has BG, BGP come up recently as the right answer to a problem where it typically may not have been expected in the old days? One of the, the philosophies that I'm, I'm going through as we're looking at designing networks for, for customers, especially at a global scale, is moving to this idea of building the network around pockets of BGP. And think about it on the idea that we start with, uh, I'm going to build the core of the network. That's kind of my central point of connectivity that typically talks to the data center, maybe some of my campuses. But I'm going to make that a BGP ASN. So that's going to be the center of the universe. And then as I kind of stand up services, whether that's maybe a, a data center fabric, uh, maybe that's into my DMZ. I'm going to build those again as different autonomous system numbers. I'm going to use private numbering for folks that are familiar with that. It's very similar to like RFC 1918 addresses that I can use them within my organization. But I'm going to really kind of build a BGP network for individual services. And then what I do here that's a little interesting is I only worry about connectivity within my region. My goal is to provide routing connectivity to the edges of my network. 
And then I'm going to exchange routes kind of BGP between the two. And again, it allows me to build these little pockets that if I have a bad day, I don't propagate that bad day all the way across the network. I can put some barriers in place to provide you know, poor route propagation or failure conditions from that scenario. And it allows me to break the network up into these smaller domains that allows me faster change control processes. It's, it's going to allow me kind of more specific uh, control as to what I do from, from a route perspective. And then we kind of just build that philosophy out. If you really look at and where this idea came from is most of our large global cloud providers, if we think Amazon, AWS, Azure, this is the concept that they use as they build these smaller administrative domains, smaller convergence times within those. And then they use that for actually, you know, protection from kind of propagation or issues that kind of expand itself across the network. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that same idea that it's almost the same reason BGP is used on the internet is we want to have, we don't want to impact the entire internet with a change that happens at Kareem's house. Right. Yeah. And so in a large enterprise, we're starting to get lots of different areas and we don't want to impact each other because that's what the traditional kind of interior protocols do is I yeah. have a change with OSPF on one part of my network. It's going to affect everywhere. There's really two pieces with that is that the, the first is um, one, I think it speaks to how large and how complex a lot of these networks are getting these days is the first piece. And the second where Historically, we built a network around fast convergence. We're starting to see more and more effort being built into networks that we provide redundancy and that we want stability. So I don't want to propagate mm -hmm. these challenge changes all the way across the network. We want to maintain kind of a steady state as much as possible. And BGP and kind of breaking up these smaller administrative domains kind of helps with, meet that need. Brian, clearly, you know, you know this inside and out. And, you know, I, I can't, I myself, um, it's pretty fascinating. I've learned a lot just within the next last seven minutes. Um, for those snackers that are interested in getting to that next level, can you talk a little bit about your experience and how you became like this BGP guru? So I think the easiest way to, to talk about this is I'm a firm believer in certifications. And I think that going through that certification process, more importantly, what I have to learn to become certified, but more importantly, those checks to validate that what I'm learning is 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 the best way to go about it. If I think back to when I started my path, it was the CCNP, kind of the good, the good old fashioned CCNP where that started and then on into the CCIE. But I think that going through Cisco U and the learning courses that are there to teach the fundamental skills becomes the foundation kind of, of how we build these overall skill sets. And it's still, BGP still comes in kind of at that CCNP level, right? So it's there's parts of it that are touched on in enterprise core, We've got the entire advanced routing concentration that can be the way that uh, folks earn their CCNP enterprise today. And, and we do have learning in paths and training for that in Cisco U. So that's definitely a great place to check it out. And uh, I will promise everybody that's watching that thought we just bribed Brian to say he's a firm believer in certifications. No, he legitimately is. Uh, Brian, what's, what is your uh, experience, personal experience with certifications? Uh, how, when are you going to earn your CCNA finally? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so what I'm finally going to learn my CCNA is, uh, unfortunately, I actually don't want to admit for how long that I've had it because that would be an admission of, of how old that I am at this point. <laughs> but but certifications <laughs> have been a major part of my career. And, and the way that I've always looked at it is um, they were what gave me confidence probably to take the next step into my career. It's one of those pieces where sometimes I felt that I was ready to maybe take the next step. And, and again, I was typically... Um, again, way back when I was typically the youngest person on the team. So I always felt like I was having to justify my role in, in the organization. But as I would go out and get certified, it kind of gave me that piece that I could walk around and say, like, no, 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 I can do this. This is important work it meets. And I, I took the path. I went CCNA into the CCNP. I used that to kind of spread out into, into security and collaboration in that case. And ultimately went through the, the, the CCIE process, which, again, I know seems like a very daunting task for a number of folks. But that was the logical step for me. But it was clearly for me, it was what I built my career, my career upon. It's kind of taking that step and using that as to kind of further my career, whether it was just new roles, new responsibilities, or just making sure that I kind of felt like I was ready to do what I needed to do moving forward. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining Kareem and I for this session. So uh, before we jump into the very end of this, I did do a little bit of on the fly checking. And so I looked to see how many BGP routes are out there. <laughs> of course you and did. And so... So let's, I, I will say you may have been affected a little bit by the problem with global inflation, right? Eight million is a little high. Do you want to take another swing at it before I tell you about how many routes there are, at least what I could find on the top Google searches? Oh, let's let's actually bring that back to maybe about two million. Let, let, let's scale that back to about two million where that sits. 
Yeah. So I will say that there's probably more active reports. I didn't have a router I could check on, but the Google searching from a report from recently is showing we just crested 900,000. So we're not even at a million routes yet in the prefixes in the table. I, we can He's take that argument ahead. offline. <laughs> 8x inflation i like it all right brian well thank you so much for coming to join us on snack minute here we hope to have you back but we have a bit of a tradition for first timers that come and talk with us on snack minute so think back if you could have one superpower what would your super power be so this is easy in this world where we're always on video always communicating with folks my mine would be the ability to turn invisible so I could get away, get up and walk away from those four hour conference calls when I just need 10 minutes away from the screen. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Invisibility is always a popular one. Doesn't that just turn off your your camera? Like that's, <laughs> you, you don't need a superpower for that. I feel like I'm never off it. <laughs> I want to be awesome. able to Thank clone you, myself, right? Split aside. So leave like a holographic version of Hank just here looking interested while I wander and hit the restroom and get some more snacks. Exactly. All right, Snackers. Well, this has been fun. Brian, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, thank you, Hank. And thank you, Snackers. And watch us on our next episode of Snack Minute.